Um, so thank you all for coming. This is the last step in your practicum, summer practicum grade. And again, we will be really strict on time, so make sure you're concise about the five things you learned. <laughs> for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Amelia. Um, and I worked at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum this summer, and then I helped out at Brooklyn Historical Society's Crossing Borders Bridging Generations project, which I'll call CBBG from now on because we have five minutes. Um, so at the Tenement Museum, all of their tours are dialogic, but they have this wonderful program called Tour and Discussion that's like extra dialogic. It's built around the discussions visitors can have about their connections to the histories and the issues that the tour arise, as opposed to having the discussions on top of sort of just getting the visitors the stories. So I worked on that project, and I interviewed all of the facilitators that gave it, read a lot about dialogic programs and discussion facilitation, observed a huge amount of tours, and using all that created a facilitation handbook, and then tested it by being trained, designing my own tour, and giving it to real members of the public. So through that, and my work at CBBG, which was um, helping prepare their curriculum. It's a multi-generational, interracial oral history project about Brooklyn, and the curriculum looks at the idea of race and how to teach it in middle and high school, and I helped prepare that for the designer. So this is what I learned. Um, first and foremost, access takes many forms. This wonderful illustration is something you get when you're being trained to give a tour, and it talks about physical mobility issues and the number of steps it takes to get up and down the stairs. Um, but when I with both of the projects I was working on, I was thinking about access in other ways beyond the physical. It was um, emotional and intellectual access to the issues being discussed, and then structural access, how to provide support for visitors to access these ideas, and for the educators, both formal and informal, giving the programs to access support. And so I could talk about access for a long time, but we have five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, asking questions as an art form is another lesson that I kept coming back to. Um, the tour and discussion program is a facilitated discussion at its heart and it's built around questions. And the first time I gave it, I asked way too many questions, way too quickly, way too soon, which were way too hard. And sort of through the staring at blank faces of members of the public, I was able to learn that that wasn't the thing to do and then had the support of Tenement Museum and observing tours and talking to facilitators to learn how to ask better questions and how to integrate them more seamlessly into public humanities projects. I think my biggest lesson at the Tenement Museum was to be aware of nostalgia. And of course, this didn't just happen at the Tenement Museum, but at almost every exhibit I visited. Um, and I went into the summer thinking nostalgia was sort of where it was at. It was this great intimate connection we had with our past that allowed us to connect to a larger past and larger issues. And what I learned was that it can do that, but it also is how we construct our identity. And when you co-opt that identity, into a larger narrative or you challenge it with facts that don't necessarily align, visitors can tend to shut down or push back. And so it's this wonderful tightrope to walk of how to navigate it. And of course you have to navigate it because we all have nostalgia. Um, second to last, leave room for serendipity. Without fail, my favorite moments of the summer and the things that I thought were the best public humanities moments were unplanned. They were in Central Park when it started to rain and instead of watching the play, the actors and the audience were interacting as people and it motivated the rest of the play to be much better. Um, it was on a tour when two visitors who would never have met had to talk to each other and think about their opinions differently or realize that their grandparents grew up in the next tenement to each other and how that affects their identity. And so that's sort of one of my challenges moving forward is, is how to leave room for serendipity as we design these public humanities projects. And last but not least, I was reminded to be a mensch, um, which for those of you that aren't as well versed in Yiddish as I became this summer, it's sort of an all around good person. And I was reminded this by the wonderful work environments at BHS and at the Tenement Museum where people are really kind to each other and really support risk taking. And from that, these wonderful programs arise. So with that, any questions? Nailed it. <laughs> um, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Alyssa Anderson. I'm a second year PhD student in American Studies. Um, and this is how I spent my summer vacation. It is going to take a minute to load. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I really want the video. <laughs> Well, 
we'll start talking around the video. <laughs> so uh, the first thing that I learned um, about the summer is that the International House exists. So this is the organization that I worked for. It's a nonprofit that's actually located just a few blocks away from Brown. Um, and a lot of people think it's associated with the university, but it's actually not. It's been in that location for almost 50 years. Uh, it's been around for about 50 years in total. And the mission is to help uh, international, mostly graduate students who are at Brown, and then also uh, community members, existing kind of ethnic groups that are in the community, uh, to provide them a social space to connect. And so it's unique in the fact that they do offer a few classes but it's mostly geared towards being a social space where people uh, can meet and get together and um, have those kinds of experiences. This is going to kill me. Should I wait or should I keep going? Or we keep going. There's lovely videos, I promise. Um, so the second thing that I learned is about a small, uh, the advantages and perils of having a small staff. And you're seeing in this video here, um, all of the past staff members. So something that's unique about International House is that they've never had a staff of more than two and a half people. Uh, so two full-time, one half part-time. And uh, even though they've served upwards of 400 students at various times, um, it's a very small, very dedicated staff and then a lot of volunteers. <laughs> um, so with the small staff, the advantages of that is that, you know, generally everybody knows what's going on in everybody else's department uh, because there's not very many of them, but then the perils can be that if you have some kind of triumvirate or duo or whatever it is who aren't, uh, don't get along well, they have different management styles, whatever it is, it could actually grind everything to a halt. <laughs> the third thing I learned this summer uh, is that food is, uh, if, if you feed people, they will come. So International House actually utilizes this technique probably better than uh, any other organization that I've ever seen. They have these wonderful traditions of Thursday potlucks uh, where everybody brings a dish and a lot of times people who are just relocating to the US from somewhere else can bring some kind of home cooking and it's a source of comfort but it's also a great way to meet people in a kind of arrangement that's uh, pretty disarming. Uh, it's pretty casual. And then they also do what they call the ethnic dinners, which may need to be renamed, uh, which are if people want to come and, and cook a whole meal of their home country, whatever it is, uh, they invite the Providence public to that. And it's a great way for these two groups to meet. And so over the years, International House has really perfected that art. The fourth thing that I learned is about technology, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> Um, so when I first started uh, this project, they basically gave me free reign. Uh, they asked me to do an oral history of their 50 years in existence, and they said, whatever you want the final product to look like, that's what it should be. And so I had all these great ideas about creating this video, and then we're going to create clips that we're going to put on the website, and then we're going to have a way for people to record their own history because alumni of International House are so spread out. Um, but if the pictures were working, you would see that uh, a lot of the staff members and, and volunteers are in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And so technology meant something very different to these people. Um, so the other pictures I had is I've actually been in touch with uh, the director from the early 70s, and she sent me all these amazing historical photos that you are not seeing. Um, but one of them is that they used to have this fundraiser every year um, where they created these elaborate sets out of cardboard in Miam Auditorium, and they sold food, and it was the International Fair. And so I have a picture of them sitting on the cardboard, and I kind of use that as a metaphor for the fact that what I went into was trying to give them basically steel plates and blow torches, and these are cardboard people. And they did amazing things with the cardboard, uh, and I'll send you pictures later if you want to see, but uh, it wasn't the technology that worked best for them. They worked in a very different medium than I did. And so the kinds of things that I ended up leaving them were uh, things like Dropbox, which it took us all summer to master, but man, do they use Dropbox now. So it, in some ways, that's a better, a, a best practice in its own right. So. And the fifth thing that I learned is that um, I like people more than I thought I did. And I know that that's a weird thing to say as a public human, but I'm also a PhD student and I spend a lot of time by myself just through the nature of the work. And so through working with these amazing people who have essentially became all of my extended grandmothers and aunts and everything this summer, uh, I kind of realized that that's something that energizes me and that really I'm passionate about and, and keeps me going with my own work. And it's an element that I want to incorporate into my work further down the line. So. So this summer I was at, I did my practicum at two organizations, but I'm just going to talk about Community Labor United because it was more interesting. Um, so at Community Labor United, I helped to conduct an evaluation of um, an artist in residence project called 
the Department of Public Imagination. So three artists were placed at three grassroots community organizing entities in the city of Boston. Community Labor United is sort of an umbrella organization that works to unite community and labor interests. Right now, that means mostly that they're trying to get the trade unions to be in solidarity with the community in terms of the rampant development happening in working class neighborhoods. So it's very geared towards, you know, um, sort of creating solidarity networks for working class urban residents. Um, so the three artists did various um, sort of projects with the communities, but they had a certain framework that they were working under, and I evaluated that. So I um, actually came on the ground while the program was still happening, and I did interviews, um, many, many interviews, so many hours of interviewing, which was great. Um, I did a couple of um, a couple of focus groups, and then I also went to various events. So that's kind of the background. So what did I learn? <laughs> the most important thing that I learned is that for me, I need to create a framework to help me define the work I want to do, which is public and humanist, but also rooted in organizing activism and in intentional politics. My work with Clue, as well as Steve's post this summer in the Seven Rules of the Public Humanities, helps me to come up with a tentative framework for what I'm going to call, right for right now, the radical public humanities. I outline it here because it frames my other four lessons. So radical public humanities projects are rooted in or informed by histories, challenge the status quo, empower the marginalized, take people where they are but don't shy, shy away from trying to move them, balance bottom-up and top-down approaches, lift up silenced voices, but also critically examine systems of power. They are participatory and democratic. They structure projects around organizing. They require expertise, technological skill, creativity, leadership, and innovation. The movement needs a fresh approach, and I don't mean radical as in, in opposition to everything we know that you know, is positive and can push change. But they de certainly define these terms a bit differently than the average business school might. The Radical Humanities aim to create a hub of artists, educators, organizers, instigators, dissidents, scholars, and marginal community members to, as the Zapatista saying goes, build a new world in the shell of the old. So, <laughs> now that we know what that is, one thing, one thing I learned while trying to do Radical Public Humanities is that it's incredibly difficult. <laughs> Um, so at Clue, the three artists were at different organizations. All of these organizations are actually working on the same thing, but their funding streams are different. They're competing for funds. They're not speaking to each other. They're three different neighborhoods in Boston, all fighting development, which is coming from the main, same main route, but they often don't speak. Um, you know, members' stories are often oversimplified because organizing, too, has serious challenges and is fitting into kind of a status quo of its own. Um, there's not much time for creativity, and anything that seems secondary is often sidelined. And then, also, radical projects are often co-opted by mainstream economic and community development projects. I could go on and on about the challenges, but it is possible. <laughs> this project had a lot of really positive um, sort of impacts in the community in a way that fit in with the framework I outlined above, and we obviously don't have time to go into that. But just as an example, one of the artists worked with a group of youth in Chelsea, who an incredibly diverse group of working class youth, in a sort of ethnographic image project that went around and collected images of their city. And not only was he doing this in a collaborative way that was co-designed, but it also was an intentionally rooted in a campaign that they are going to be working on to protect them from, from gentrification, from development, sort of rampant onslaught in that neighborhood. So it was intentionally created in order to prepare the community to own the place they live. So that's one example of how it's possible. Um, so. Also, and, and I think this is going to be something we hear a lot, um, program evaluation is extremely important across the board. Um, so that, that was really, I mean, I, I can't go into how much I learned just from doing so many interviews and you know, trying to think about what happened and what didn't happen and map onto the goals and create a logic model. And you know, it, was all, it, it was all very useful. And I'm continuing the work, actually, in an independent study with Steve. So it's very useful. But the traditional discussions about impact need to be retooled for the radical public humanities. 
The reason that I'm talking more about these abstractions is that actually it was really difficult for me to understand what happened on this project in many ways because the ways in which art, humanities, organizing has created uh, you know, frameworks and tools for understanding what its success means are not oriented to these kinds of projects. So in a way, we need to, I need to, and I hope some of you need to, work on creating tools and frameworks that um, fit in with this new, not new, actually very old, but <laughs> this orientation. Um, so, so yeah, these are just inherited practices and ways of measuring. And of course, they're coming from you know, back to the, the challenges, the grant providers, the, the systems that are pressuring all of these groups in a certain way. Um, and that obviously leads me to my final point, which is that the radical public humanities needs you too. And with the current state of the environment, the economy, global poverty, conflict, and this country's role in all of this, I'm thinking that it's time for art, history, literature, and all of our other frameworks to help inform and perhaps even lead as Lucy Parsons tells us, the march off the edge of our maps. That's it. Okay. I had some really good quotes to read to you, which I'm, I did not memorize, so I will send those to you all later. But, um, okay, I'm starting. So here's the... Uh, Here's the image that sold the lane to me. Um, and while I was going to read a quote about what it was like to be at the lane while you looked at this, um, I was at a social practice, experimental social practice art residency. Um, and these are the images that I saw of the lane before I left. Um, welcome to the briefest of guides to a few lessons of Mildred's Lane, aka trust your gut and accept it, while questioning everything critically but not always academically. The uh, quote that I was going to read to you had to do with, um, it was from our social practice art class about how when you work in a non-hierarchical environment, it's like everyone telling the same joke but not holding back their laughter while trying to tell it. And that's probably the best description of what it's like to be at the lane. And I have a whole bunch of images, not necessarily arranged in a cohesive way, but it's trying to replicate my experience of the lane, where things just come at you. And anyway, so I learned about collaboration versus collectivity. I learned that hard manual labor brings people together quickly. I learned about the sublime object of collaborative social practice art, um, the intentional and fantastical life of Mildred's Lane. These are the staff portraits to illustrate the intentional, fantastical life of Mildred's Lane. There's the Ministry of Comfort, where I, what I, I was a part of, and some days felt like this, where you're exalted, and you look like a Vermeer painting. Other days look like this, where it's <laughs> like 20 loads of laundry in a row. Um, I learned a lot of things while at the lane. Talk to me about it later. Um, the most important thing was people can and will surprise you. This goes either way. Um, and to round it <coughs> out, here are a few other images of things that happened at the lane. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't have those beautiful, beautiful quotes. I have two minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> Were you in that picture? Yeah. You were the one on the left? Yeah. So, um, I had, I would say, 10% say of how that turned out. <laughs> go Could ahead. you go back to the slide that had like the long list of things? <laughs> sure. So <laughs> what is your theory of as you go? Yeah. OK, so as you go. it as like tons of lessons instead of what you learned. <laughs> oh, well, I would phrase like the slides before of what I learned. And then I just decided to illustrate that five minutes was not enough to talk about <laughs> all the things that I learned. And there are some interesting practical lessons that I learned at the lane, so I just started to list a few of them. Um, and they are running off the page on purpose. Go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the lane and kind of how it 
exist? Yes. Um, it was started by Mark Dine and J. Morgan Pewitt uh, about 14 years ago. And it basically runs like an art camp where there are facilitators, there are um, visiting artists, there are students, there are fellows. It's a very complicated place. Um, there are also public programs. There are big social Saturdays every Saturday that are open to the public, um, of, of which about 150 people would come to each Saturday. Um, Lauren came, talked to Lauren about social Saturdays. Um, the Order of the Third Bird facilitated a session, and they'll be here in November, so you'll get a taste of what that was like. But each session was remarkably different from the last, depending on who was facilitating it, who came, um, and what they did. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do they have sessions year-round or just in the summer? Mostly in the summer, but there's a winter reading session. If you were in charge of it, how would you change it? <laughs> I would not be so anarchistic in terms of the organizational methods. I think um, it's meant to be disarming. It's meant to be challenging. And I think that it could have been a little softer. Go ahead. It, I'm going to try to make this simple. If you could um, rank the work that people were excited about, the most quote unquote empowering work projects, and think about things that people most wanted to do, because there is a hierarchy of work. Yeah. And think it is not hierarchical as in everyone had access to empowering work. There were various degrees of non hierarchy and horizontality. Um, the, the part where I felt it the most was probably during this um, floor scrubbing session where Morgan got down on her hands and knees and was scrubbing the floor with us. But um, this was also a really difficult experience for me because it felt really pretentious and like the folks weren't ac acknowledging the privilege that they had that to make scrubbing a floor fun. So, um, yeah, the, everything is complicated at the lane, <laughs> and everything was really beautiful. So, thank you. All right, so my name is Kate Duffy, and I spent the summer as a fellow at the Newport Historical <laughs> Society. This is what it looks like. It's a small organization that operates a few colonial sites around town. Uh, they offer walking tours and they also run a museum. I um, mean, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's running on kind of a low budget, but they do a lot with the resources they have. And it's in Newport and here's some lovely flowers for you to see. <laughs> so uh, the first thing I learned is that museum ghosts haunt the living. Um, the project that I worked on, my primary project, was to research Newport's Lost Natural History Museum, um, which <laughs> um, kind of died because people started to think of it as boring. Um, so in a way, it's a history of fun and uh, recreation, as well as a history of science. Here's the prize moose, the number one specimen, which ended up being given away as a wedding gift to the director's friends. <laughs> um, and this project hit kind of close to home because the Natural History Museum is the tiny little wing that you see off the back there. And this is actually the Historical Society's property. So the, the Natural History Museum was right on the back of the Historical Society at one point in time. Um, and I started to realize that the Historical Society itself is this whole palimpsest of lost museums. Um, there also used to be a maritime museum in the basement. Um, and uh, so and the staff was very interested in what happened to these museums. Um, the Historical Society itself had uh, come, ha is, like I said, is operating on a very low budget. And in the past, they had come close to having to close. So it's been a struggle. And they were very interested in um, learning about P.T. Barnum and his museum practices and how he got people excited about it, or learning about this other kind of museum that failed and what happened. So I had all these conversations with staff about museum history. And so my project was kind of relevant um, in a way that I didn't quite anticipate when I got there. Second le uh, lesson, algae is magic. Uh, so the other project I worked on was curating an exhibit of dried seaweed. So this is kind of a almost lost Victorian craft form where particularly women would go out and gather seaweed and arrange it artistically in albums that they could show off in their parlors. Um, 
this is yeah some of the images from my exhibit. Um, I was invited to go on a seaweed collecting foray with a group of phycologists from Roger Williams University. And it was only when I did this that I truly grasped the uh, appeal of seaweed collecting because it is meditative, it is calming, it is beautiful and peaceful. Um, you're on this quest for these beautiful organic life forms and the ocean is a garden. And uh, just realizing this, it was, it was really interesting, and I had a visceral understanding of what the seaweed collectors were all about. And I tried to hold on to this sense of wonder about the natural world. I mean, there's a lot of problems with Victorian natural history as a thing, but one thing that I tried to take from it was this sense of wonder and appreciation and close observation of nature. So we went on a field trip to Blythewald, and the gardener gave me this pine cone, and I was observing it closely as a naturalist and thinking about how it became a tree. And I was just like, yes, this is so cool. And you know, just taking the time to appreciate those tiny, obvious seeming things. Third, without contraries is no progression. This is a quote from William Blake. Um, so I, working on this exhibit, there are limitations in terms of budget, in terms of space, um, and in terms of the fact that that case that you see there um, is not really adequate for uh, displaying natural history specimens. So I had to kind of work around all of these things um, and work with the staff to come up with the exhibit. Um, but in the end, I think the limitations uh, it force you to be a little more creative or to think in a different way. And it, it turned out well. This is what it looked like um, in the end. Um, and we, you can see we did manage to display a few real things. Here's a detail. Come, step into Neptune's garden. <laughs> And they ended up making merch out of it, which I thought was kind of funny. So, so it became a revenue generator in a way. Number four, professionalization and its discontents. So I'm gonna start off with this picture, which is actually from the Newport Artillery Company, um, which is very close to the historical society. Um, and it has a lot of kind of military relics or war relics, and it's operated by former members of the military uh, for the most part. Um, and going here, so they don't. So um, going here was interesting because they don't use the normal collections practices. Like they let you uh, try and lift up an iron chain just to see how heavy it was, or they let you try on the helmet of a World War One tank gunner. Um, and in a way, um, we, we went on a field trip here, and afterward, uh, the, those of us who attended got in this big debate over professionalization. And to me, it was very, I loved experiencing things in this way, and it, it allows you to build a personal collection to, to objects. And this is against the backdrop of the Newport Historical Society um, trying to in, uh, improve its own collections practices. So as you can see, we have some wonderful textiles and, and costumes and things like that um, that they're trying to protect, which I think is really important. Um, but I also kind of hope that some of the, the charm that now exists isn't renovated out. They're actually doing a big uh, renovation project for the whole building and everything. So, um, and there, that is really important. I think it's huge. I think it's going to be great. But part of me hopes that we can learn some of the things from the uh, people who aren't using the quote unquote best practices, because sometimes that can be valuable as well. Final thing, the art and mystery of setting textiles on fire. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with a very pr bit, of, uh, bit of practical uh, information, which I didn't know before coming, which is that if you set little textiles on fire, you can actually identify them by the way that they smell. So uh, cotton, uh, cotton smells like paper, wool smells like hair, silk smells like meat, and petrochems smell really bad. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's all. Thank you very much. I'm just going to say three things first, which are the three things that I learned. Good morning, before I start this. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, I basically created a video to show the mechanics of my summer practicum. Um, but the three lessons that I'd like to say that I learned are, one, the practical skill of framing, handling artworks, and archiving artworks. Uh, which you'll see in a second. Two, uh, that it's very effective when professional development is a part of the curriculum of a school, which I'll explain shortly. And three, that it is possible to go back and forth between a creative practice and to be in the professional world of that creative uh, little tinge. So otherwise, I'm going to play this video, which sort of 
describes my summer, which was a combination of professional development and art and uh, creative practice. Um, I worked at Artist Proof Studio, which is a school and printmaking studio, but I'll start off with my creative practice because that's the most exciting for me. Uh, I don't know <laughs> why I'm getting the spinning wheel. We've been having some slow network mornings. <laughs> Um, but the main part of my creative practice, what I'll say um, while we wait for the video to load, was working with my band. Um, so I, three days a week, worked at the Artist Proof Studio, and the other days of the week I rehearsed uh, with my band. We played gigs, um, we did some community work. Yes. Uh, I also, at Artist Proof Studios, uh, learned some printmaking, specifically etching. And another part of my creative practice was just going to lots of exhibitions, shows, and performances to sort of see what's happening in the scene. Um, so yeah, just developed lots of connections um, over the summer, uh, one being uh, the planetarium at Vich University, uh, where uh, we were working on a project, but we did typical things that bands do. We got to record at SABC Studios, we, we were on the radio, um, and we did some work at a library, we had some photo shoots. Um, so, yeah, so that was the creative practice, the band stuff, and I found that a lot of the skills um, that I needed to use at Artist Proof Studio, administrative skills, uh, was necessary for uh, just organizing band stuff, like organizing gigs, setting contracts, and, and such. Um, so the other thing uh, that I'll say is we spent time at the Cape Town World Music Festival, and I got to learn the behind the scenes of that, as well as present uh, with the band on Afrofuturism and the idea of Sankofa. Um, so again, it was interesting to learn the behind the scenes, the mechanics of uh, the, sh the festival itself, but to also be a part of the festival um, as an artist. And then I'll just move on as quickly as I can to Artist Proof Studio, which is uh, basically a huge monster of greatness. It's a combination of a printmaking school, a pro shop, a pro printmaking shop, a um, a gallery and special projects. I worked mainly on special projects, which was um, this project called Art Connection, where we took donated works from the school, uh, as well as other South African artists, and went to different communities where they may not have access to the arts or may not be able to afford um, such artworks. Um, and I helped to curate those different spaces with community members, which was really, really awesome, um, and sort of a different uh, perspective. So, yeah, this was a poster that was created for that, and uh, I had to catalog all the works that we did have and then go on site to different locations um, to figure out what, what should go in this space and what's happening in this space and why. Um, so, yeah. I learned how to write contracts for permanent donations and things of that nature. Uh, what else can I say? These are some of the artists um, which we have in our catalog, I can say. Um, Impact Hub is one of the first spaces where I was able to curate some works. Um, this is some printmaking we did. Uh, this was a fun project because it was a four meter long print and we only had a two meter long uh, belt. <laughs> so we had to be creative about how um, to create one long print of tons of pieces uh, in a single print. So that's the unveiling of that. Um, so yeah, I learned a lot of practical skills as an artist. I learned a lot of um, administrative skills in terms of uh, being in a school space, a gallery space, and, and whatnot. And uh, I'll just stop there 
and open it for questions if there's any time. I know that was a lot <laughs> to process. Where is Artist Proof? Artist Proof Studio is in Johannesburg, South Africa. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest challenge? Uh, my biggest challenge was um, trying to understand how to be productive in the space that has so many different activities going on at once and wanted to utilize the skills that I did have. Um, so just learning when to say, well, why don't you talk to this student, for example, who you employ um, to do this project or to do this aspect of the project so that I can focus here? Or why don't I show such and such this and then you can sustain that work without me? Thanks. Hi, I'm Sophia. And I spent my summer working with the Spiral Jetty Partnership. And um, it's a bit of a disclaimer. I totally loved this practicum in all sorts of wonderful ways. And coming up with five things I learned, it was hard to not make them like intensely personal. So they mostly are. Oh, um, so this is this is where I spent a lot of time. That's my that's my tent. And I got to live with Spiral Jetty, and it was this really kind of wonderful experience. All right, Spiral Jetty, for those of you who don't know, is a work of land art that was created in the 1970s by a New York-based artist. It is very much like it sounds. It is a jetty in the shape of a spiral, 1,500 feet long, and it goes out and spirals into the Great Salt Lake. Now, this work of art is owned by Dia Art Foundation, which is way over in New York. However, as I mentioned, Spiral Jetty is located in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Dia was having a difficult time really acting as a steward for this work of art, so they partnered with the Utah Museum of Fine Art and the Great Salt Lake Institute, and together created this partnership to steward the work. And I jumped in as their first person. They don't have a staff person, they don't have, never had an intern before. So I jumped in to help them figure out how they were going to work collaboratively to care for this seminal work of art, which was a totally amazing experience. What I learned. Land art is really, really complicated. It's not a park, it's not public, it's not private. It's often owned by absentee foundations, organizations, and estates. In some ways, it's no one's land. So the bureaucracy and the laws and the access that go into land art was just unlike anything I'd ever experienced before, and Spiral Jetty was like the case study for this. Our understanding of the physical world is based on personal experience. Things may not be as they seem. <laughs> and I was in such a foreign environment physically that I did not understand the world could physically be like this. The salt flats, the sun, the radiation. This water is indeed pink. It's difficult to tell in this, but it's like Kool-Aid pink. And we are not moving because it's like sitting in jello because the salinity is so high that you just float. And so my whole understanding of what it means to swim, what it means to be around water, what it means to be in the sun, totally changed and shifted. Recognize what you don't know. And using partnerships and collaborations to fill gaps and skills and awareness of communities can be really, really positive. This is an image from a map in Utah and Dia had not been around for a while. They had not been in Utah for like decades before this partnership. And so local communities didn't know what Spiral Jetty was. They'd been hearing about this like art talk, something called Spiral Jetty. But in the rural Utah dialect, it came across as Spiral Jetty. And it started to appear like that on maps. So this is like the big tourist attraction map where people had never been spiral jetty, but I'd heard about it. So recognizing where you could really use help, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a good place to start a partnership. <laughs> Context and environment. These are things that we talk about in um, classes all the time. I talk about them in museum interpretation all the time. When you talk about context and environment in terms of land art, totally different meaning. It's actual like physical environment, and the context is not about the painting that's on the wall next to it. It's about the entire experience of being there. So the environment includes 
dead pelicans and being able to track their migration patterns because people are actually going out and making this pilgrimage to see this work of art. So they're reporting on pelican migrations now. And part of the context of being there is being incredibly dehydrated and sunburned. And it's like this, this understanding of experiencing art was totally shifted. This is my favorite one. Oh my goodness. Let it be. <laughs> so Spiral Jetty is hours from anything. There are no signs. I don't know that you've gotten anywhere, arrived anywhere, except you feel it. There's nothing that says Spiral Jetty. There's nothing that says made by Robert Smithson. There's nothing that says owned by Dia. There's nothing that says don't climb on rocks. There's nothing that says do climb on rocks. You're just there. And the partnership had decided that as stewards, they would just let it be. They've committed to no signage, no restoration, no psychological, conceptual, physical, environmental interventions at all. And to see these like major art world players make that decision of just hands off was this really kind of magical, wonderful moment. And um, it was really freeing. Questions? <laughs> Did you have to live in the tent during the summer? I got to live in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was it was not required. I do, I did have an office space. I did put together a report. This is my table of contents for like a written strategic plan trajectory report. Um, but this is where I spent most of most of most of my my time um, by choice. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, so I'll try to do a very brief run through of a very confusing place. Um, I spent my summer at Meta Lab at Harvard. So a brief before I talk about what I learned, what does that even mean? Good question. Um, so Meta Lab at Harvard is a research and teaching unit. It's kind of co-hosted between various areas. Um, they focus on digital experiments, technology, network culture in the arts and humanities. Um, so they're co-hosted basically by the Graduate School of Design and this lovely yellow house, which is known as the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. So the Berkman Center is started in the law school, but it's become kind of all the schools of Harvard. Anyone who's interested in sort of the internet as how it reflects on society, internet research from all different angles. So my internship was hosted by both. So I was part of this wider Berkman community, thinking about all kinds of internet stuff, um, but I focused mostly at MetaLab. And so MetaLab, they're always doing a ton of different projects, they work in a lot of different ways, um, kind of depends on where funding comes from, who they're partnering with. My main project, although I was involved with kind of all their projects, was Beautiful Data. Um, which was this really intense two-week workshop, um, which had about 22 participants, one of which was Steve. Um, it was basically bringing together scholars, curators, designers, technologists, to think about open collections and collections data. And if we're moving all this stuff to being open, what can we actually do with it? What can we make with it? So I was involved in kind of planning for, running, documenting that whole workshop, and then also was in charge of sort of a experimental low-key publication project that came out of it. Okay, so what did I learn? Quick run through. Tech and the humanities have a lot to offer each other. This is not groundbreaking news, um, but I think just being in this Cambridge sort of internet community, um, as they call it, all summer really got me thinking in this in a lot of different ways. So I went to tons of events and was always working with people from Berkman who are in all different disciplines, people at MIT in the Media Lab, people at Microsoft Research, who just work in really different ways for me. And it really made me think, kind of breaking down the hard skills, soft skills binary, and also made me remember, yes, humanities should be getting better at tech, but also tech can learn a lot from humanities, and especially public humanities, having conversations about access and audience, and what does it mean when we code in certain features, and all of this was really, really useful for me to think about. Number two, um, how I can work with designers and technologists. Something I really wanted to get out of working at MetaLab this summer was being immersed in 
thinking about how my skill set intersects with design, with computer science, with these different areas. So that was really great for me. I worked really closely all summer with people who have all these skills that are not like mine. And it was great to figure out where my ideas and my public humanities lens and the things that I am good at intersect with the things that they're good at. Um, and so one of the big things for me was just learning the language of collaboration with these people, meaning if I am asking about a certain design element, is that a huge task for a designer or not? Um, if I'm talking about, you know, I'd like to get this feature coded into the site, what does that mean? What word should I use? So just kind of the language of collaborating was really important. Number three, um, skills for managing a creative project. Like I said, I was in charge of this kind of multifaceted experimental publication project. Um, and so it was really open, which meant that I had a lot of creative room to work. And so I was able to conceptualize these kind of PDFs and a website, write a lot of stuff for it. But on the flip side, I was also not just the editorial director, but the project director. So tons of people were involved in this project and everyone brought really different skills and every aspect needed a lot of different things done. So just being the person who was the point person, writing an agenda, setting a meeting, figuring out how often to check in with someone or not, delegating tasks, all of that kind of just project management stuff, especially when it's a really kind of free-flowing creative project, um, was a huge learning experience for me. Probably the most valuable stuff I learned is just that kind of like sending an email now, setting a meeting for Friday, those kinds of things. Um, moving right along. Here's my token networking slide. Um, basically, we obviously know networking is very important, but for me this summer, like I said, I was working with so many people who approach things so differently than me, have bring such different things to the table, um, that it was really kind of surprising to me, the common ground I found with people, and just following up with people was just as important, probably more important than those initial conversations, <coughs> especially when it was focused on projects. Um, I ended up following up on projects that I was interested about, and a lot came out of that, um, so that was really important. And finally, um, just the value of making experimenting a regular thing. All the pictures in the background, by the way, are from like the workshop, so I spent a lot of time with post-its, with Legos, um, with clay, with making weird gifts and stuff all summer, and it was great, like just playing with ideas, playing with different things, testing things out. I think I kind of lost a bit of that um, while I'm so focused on school. So it was great to get back into that and remember how thinking and making and experimenting can all go together in process. And that's it. Thank you. OK, so five things I learned. Um, I worked this summer at the Center for Digital Storytelling um, and in Berkeley. And the first thing I learned is that place matters. Um, it's really interesting hearing about all your, like, hearing about the land and then Sophia talking about your experience um, in um, Utah. Because, I mean, I feel like this is just a current that's running through what everyone, what everyone is saying. Very obvious point. But for me, I've only lived um, on the East Coast. I've, I've never lived in an urban area. So I, um, I was very intentional about moving to California this summer because I wanted to see the ways in which place um, mattered. And um, the Bay Area was a particularly interesting place to be this summer, considering what's happening with sort of the tech boom, gentrification, and for cultural institutions, and how they're um, being influenced by that. A lot of entrenched institutions actually um, going under because of all these changes. Um, and unlike a lot of you, I didn't have an office to be in. Um, it was a very small organization. So I did spend most of my time out in the city, um, or in the cities, like in coffee shops and parks, and also just sort of exploring different cultural spaces. And so I, I ended up, um, it ended up being just that uh, a big part of my experience was just being in the Bay Area. And it kind of confirmed for me that in fact, yeah, I could live in a city, and um, I do like the West Coast. So that was an important lesson for me. Um, second lesson was how to move from theory to action. Um, just thinking about Occam's razor and sort of simplicity. Um, so, oh, oh no, my pictures aren't here. No, <laughs> why aren't they here? Um, okay, well, anyways, there was supposed to be a bunch of pictures there. Hopefully they're not all gone. They're all gone, okay. Um, <laughs> that sucks, whatever, it's okay. Just envision a picture of the Center for Digital Storytelling workshop going on and people like clapping their hands and doing things. Um, so, um, 
this summer, I, I wanted to think really carefully about um, individual self-expression and then also um, how uh, individual self-expression can be used for more like systemic social change. Um, and what I really appreciated about the Center for Digital Storytelling is the simplicity of their model. Um, so a very simple um, theory of change, just you know that storytelling matters and that it can be used for social change. And then they had a very simple model, which included, um, you know, uh, so an organization would hire the Center for Digital Storytelling. They would participate in a story circle, draw out their stories, learn um, basic tools like um, video, like. Uh, videography and still image and um, just narrative construction and then uh, and video editing and then from there they would produce a digital story and what was great about sort of um, this very like elemental system was that it was very flexible so they could bring in a group of kids who were computer illiterate or maybe had learning difficulties and they could adjust to, to fit their needs but then they could bring in a group of nurses who really wanted like a really shiny um, like professional looking end product and they could accommodate their needs um, so thinking, just thinking about myself and how I like to sort of think complexly and have these grandiose plans, it was really nice for me to see that in fact, like if you if you have these very basic um, uh, models, like they can be potentially even more useful because they can be so flexible and used for so many different audiences. Oh, no pictures. Um, number three, evaluate. Um, so I talked about this in my in my blog. This was like big sticking point for me um, because I, I mentioned that. 85 to 95 percent of their funding comes from earned income, and as a result, they really haven't been pushed to evaluate. And for an organization that's um, so much of what they're about is about change, um, it seemed very strange to me that they weren't actually working to measure change. So I had a picture up that's not here of um, uh, that that came from um, a, video, a series of videos um, that were produced in Nepal. And they had done story, a storytelling workshop in Nepal um, with women who are victims of uh, gender-based violence. And then it was sort of my job to take those videos and incorporate them into training materials for law enforcement and for healthcare workers. And so I was sitting sort of in my cafe in Berkeley, like doing this work for people, you know, who I really have no relationship to. And I, I felt very strange about that and wasn't quite sure if I would be able to produce something meaningful and useful for them. But, um, and when I asked about follow-up, they said, well, actually, we don't do any follow-up. We, we pass th these materials onto the organization, and we just, we don't have the time or money or energy to follow up. And I just found that to be very problematic. Um, so something to just, I was just considering. Um, so third one, focus on both small and big picture. There's a picture here. So uh, this is a screenshot of their YouTube channel, which is very, uh, like disorganized, and they were very aware of the fact that it was disorganized, and they wanted me to fix it, but they couldn't. They never had the time to actually step back from their day to day and like figure out what they wanted to do with their um, online presence. And also, they had just changed their name to Story Center. So some places it was called Story Center, some places it was called Center for Digital Storytelling. But they they were never really given. They never gave themselves the opportunity to really step back and like consider those sort of big picture questions because they were so focused on day to day. Um, which I think was a detriment. Um, number five, follow my gut. I had a really cheesy picture um, <laughs> of me with a bunch of people in one of the workshops. Um, as many of you know, I have a lot of different interests and I have a lot of trouble sometimes figuring out which path to take. And, um, and I, even though I had some issues with the organization itself, um, with, with the Center for Digital Storytelling, um, I did like actually get so much joy from participating in these workshops, and it was so clear to me that the people who were participating actually had very meaningful experiences, like potentially life-changing experiences, even just over the course of a couple days of, of doing this workshop. And um, it sort of reconfirmed that this is the sort of work I want to be doing. I do want to be, you know, helping people um, uh, uh, with their, you know, with their self-expression, and and. Um, and yeah, basically, it was just a nice public humanities like uh, experience for me. So, any questions? <laughs> what do you think would have helped them get out of the weeds and maybe think more strategically about evaluation, or is it stat just numbers? Um, yeah, I mean, there. I think numbers is a big thing. There aren't very many of them, and they rely a lot on interns that sort of come and go very frequently. And I think that. I think they just need to reprioritize because it is true that they do have a lot of stuff to do in the day to day if they want to maintain. Um, but it, like in terms of long term sustainability, it's just not going to work. So they need to. Like, I think they need to just accept the fact that um, maybe it'll make things difficult in the short term if they don't attend to like the day to day 
issues, but in the long term, like, it would be really helpful for them if they actually, like, sat down and, like, re like considered their priorities and, like, thought about their mission and just, like, actually did some strategic planning. Um, anything else? Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so this is my presentation in five minutes, the five things that I learned during my summer at the Whitney. A um, little background, I was working on a catalog resume of Andy Warhol's films. This was kind of a very strange collaboration between the Whitney, MoMA, <clears throat> and the Andy Warhol Foundation. The five things I learned were, one, trust your instincts. Um, this kind of really harkens back to the very beginning of the practicum process. I heard from the Whitney first. It was not the department I was sort of hoping to hear from. Um, I hadn't considered working on a catalog resume of Andy Warhol's films. I didn't even realize it was an option. So I heard from them. I kind of had to decide very quickly, am I going to take this or am I going to wait to hear from someone else? But because I really wanted to be at the Whitney and because of my experience during the interview process with Claire, my supervisor, or I guess my would-be supervisor, um, <clears throat> I, I really felt like she would be great to work with. She would be a good connection to have. She seemed very sort of ready to help me build the practicum into what I was looking for. So I trusted my instinct and I took the position. Um, and this kind of also played a role in a lot of other aspects of my practicum. Sometimes it was when I was researching, um, I had to locate some nudist Buddhists from the yeah. 60s, and how do you do that? So I sort of ended up finding a family who seemed right, and I pursued them very sort of rapidly, and it turned out they were right, so that felt very good. Um, and I also sort of used it when it came to kind of capitalizing on meaningful opportunities and networking sort of scenarios that presented themselves along the way. Um, I also learned to lose, use my lunch break. This um, is kind of my favorite lesson. During my first week, I <clears throat> had an orientation to the library. I had to learn how to use all of their crazy software. And I walked past an advertisement for a show at Pace Gallery of um, Sugimoto photographs. And I was really thinking, oh my goodness, I have to come back to see this. Later that week, I was working at the library and I realized <clears throat> it does not take me an hour to eat my lunch. I could just scarf my food and go and hang out with these photographs that I really love. So I did. And then I kind of made it a goal of the rest of my summer that at least once a week, I would do something with my lunch other than eat. So I ended up doing a lot of things. I spent a lot of time on the High Line um, when I was in the Chelsea area. That's where the library was. That's where storage was. I also got permission to sort of explore the Whitney storage. Um, I made an appointment. Someone came through with me. I got to pull out the giant racks of art and sort of look at things that aren't on the walls. Um, I also sort of tried to find other bizarre opportunities. I emailed random people who I wanted to talk to and said, hi, can I meet with you for lunch today? A lot of people were really open to that, and so my lunch became a very productive time of learning outside of the office. Next lesson is to ask good questions. Um, this was kind of inspired by my supervisor, Claire. She gave an intern presentation. One of the things that Whitney does during their summer internship it, program is do a lot of sort of team building things where all of the interns gather together and different departments at the museum present on what they're doing. So this kind of um, was a way for people to learn about if you're in curatorial, what is it like in education, et cetera. So when Claire and I got back to the office after her presentation, she <coughs> asked me the name of someone who had asked a really, really good question. She kind of wrote it down in her little notebook and it was all very suspicious to me, like, why does she want his name? Am I being ousted for this good questioner? Um, but it sort of hammered home the idea that asking good questions is sometimes the only opportunity you have to open a door with someone who's giving a lecture or you know who you don't have time to speak to one-on-one. -on -one. And so this is something that I kind of try to work on throughout the summer. I can't say that I always ask the best questions. Sometimes I'm just totally blank and have no idea what to ask. Um, but I found that it was a really good, good way of um, following up with people. I would ask them a question during their lecture. I could then send them an email based on their answer. It was a good way to sort of build that relationship for me. Um, next lesson is to learn from your location. I um, 
was in New York, and so this is a very easy thing to say, but I made it a habit to speak out learning, seek out learning opportunities outside of my sort of nine to five. Um, some of this was when I was with my aunt's children in Brooklyn, um, talking to other sort of parents and nannies and finding out what sort of their relationship to the neighborhood was and the kinds of things that they're interested in and then following up on those places. Sometimes it was sort of taking advantage of opportunities that presented themselves, um, like talking to people at public theater for Shakespeare in the Park or kind of intentionally taking my cousins on field trips to educational programming at MoMA and then sort of interrogating the educators while the children were doing other things. Oh, I forgot the photos. Um, and then my last one is to create opportunities for yourself. This is kind of a really important thing for me. Um, as I mentioned early on, working on Andy Warhol's catalog resume was not what I was planning to do with your summer, with my summer. So I really um, focused on asking for what I needed. I asked my supervisor um, for, the con for the name of someone working in education so that I could approach them and found out that they had a need for volunteers. So I ended up volunteering with the kids programming. Um, I also sort of would ask for different projects at work. I spent a lot of time working on the bibliography of the catalog resume, which was kind of mindless, look at this guide, how do I make these entries correct? So I asked for other projects and I ended up um, attending a lot of screenings of Andy Warhol films that hadn't been seen in years or um, working with a really incredible collection of photographs. So it was a way to add my own interest into a project that was not my intention. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is actually in Boston, and she created, uh, in her absence, a movie for us to watch about her prison, uh, about her summer practicum. So I'm just going to get that going here. It's design located in Providence, Rhode Island, and during my practicum, I learned about American history. I got to study lots of different topics from the civil rights movement to salt marsh ecology to art and architecture during the Gilded Age to polka traditions. And to do this, I used lots of different types of sources from scholarly sources, primary and secondary sources, to looking at historical and contemporary popular culture. Doing this research, I not only learned about new areas of history, but I learned that learning about American history could be really fun for myself. Um, re-expanding my view of what interests me in American history. And learning that I enjoyed researching things I did not expect to be fun helped me with something else I learned about this summer, which was how to translate really complicated historical topics to something that would be meaningful and fun for other people to learn about. Um, to make complicated historical topics useful, one device we used was theming. I learned about taking, for example, you can see on the right a list of sites at the Connecticut Freedom Trail Often these sites had nothing to do with each other, so I had to go through and find unifying and relevant themes that would help ex current tourists figure out how they wanted to shape their own experience um, at a museum on the Freedom Trail. I also thought about contextualization, how to take historical research and fit it into a planned exhibit, existing exhibits, the organization that was sponsoring this, what it currently had, what its goals were for the future, and what its role was in its larger community. I looked at lots of contemporary present interests and figured out how to balance those with historical research. I also used a lot of editing, which is something that we had to do over and over and over again. I looked for grammar, not just the way you would look at school for what was correct, but for what would communicate most effectively. Part of that was always looking for clarity, even if that meant sacrificing some of your more creative ideas, and trying to cut as much as possible to simplify your message without losing historical truth. <laughs> Um, and finally, looking for ways to make content engaging, whether that meant through a creative medium, like using technology, um, making something interactive through a program, or even something that was very low tech, like using creative writing. Uh, I also learned about collaboration, which was something that is really a challenge for me, but was probably the most rewarding aspect of this practicum when it worked well. Uh, part of this was non-attachment. I'd come up with lots of ideas that you would just kind of need to be able to throw away when they're not practical in considering all of the different elements that need to come together in actually making an exhibit. 
Um, I also learned about listening, which happened not just when actually having discussions, but was a way of thinking so that I would anticipate how other stakeholders would respond to an idea before even proposing them. Um, and then related to that, learning to really think before sharing an idea because you don't want to waste people's time, but also to be willing to share some ideas that seem a little bit out there because sometimes they end up leading to the most effective and creative exhibits. Um, I also learned about marketing. One of my projects this summer was looking at the websites for all of our competitors and trying to figure out how we wanted to rebrand ourselves and build a new website. One of the core things I learned was that marketing is really about framing, it's not about facts. I looked at websites where there were extremely diverse types of exhibits, but they all sounded positive if they were marketed well. So we had to figure out how to take our existing resources and show the positive side of them. Um, and I learned that one of the best ways to express your message is first of all to have a very simple message um, and then to really repeat it quickly and consistently throughout a website at both a conscious and unconscious level. And one of the ways to make your message clear uh, through multiple means is through images and design. Um, obviously, this is particularly important at a design firm. <laughs> and customization is a particularly inefficient way to do this, but really necessary, I felt. Um, finally, I learned about learning. I learned that most of my coworkers learned a lot of their jobs just by doing things. I learned about using online courses to teach myself things that I didn't know. Um, and finally, I used everything I had been learning to create my own website. I had to use online courses for this too, and I learned what I was learning from the exhibit design firm. Uh, just as a little plug, I hope you will all take some time to visit my website, which I worked really hard on, still a work in progress. And it's something I never would have been able to do if I hadn't been working at this exhibit design firm. And uh, for all the things that I didn't learn this summer, this last thing that I learned was most important because it means I'll be able to keep learning in whatever jobs I have from here on. All right. Thanks, Sage. <laughs> So I'm so excited that I get a chance to talk to you all about my summer vacation because I got to do a lot of really fun things. So I went to go to the I went to the Air and Space Museum. I got to meet President Mrs. Lincoln. There's a carousel on the National Mall, which is a lot of fun to ride. I got to ride on the Sea Monster. I spent some time with FDR. You guys aren't here to hear about my summer vacation. Would you rather hear about my practicum instead? <laughs> so for my practicum, I was working at the American Museum of American History, and so it's sort of behind me out the window of the, National, uh, the Washington Monument, that photo. And it was a lot of fun, and I got to work on a lot of different projects, so my, uh, my five things are not very well, I mean not, not very coherent, but sort of some really interesting things that I learned. So collections and the research you do ranges from the amazing to the bizarre. So I was sort of a jack of all trades who did whatever was needed to help out my supervisor and then other curators throughout the entire floor of the Smithsonian where I was working. So that ranged from figuring out the date on a cigar store Indian by figuring out like when they started making the cigarettes that he was advertising to dealing with Bloomberg financial consoles that were a re recent acquisition, so writing letters to one of the founders of of Bloomberg Financial and saying, could you help us figure out when you actually sort of change the design of your financial things? To finding Lib Lady Liberty, who was supposedly, whose statue was supposedly at a train station in Omaha, Nebraska. It's impossible to document whether or not the statue was actually there, but I spent a lot of time doing that. I learned that even the Smithsonian doesn't know everything about everything. So one of the things that I ended up spending a lot of time was a, was a wooden shoe. Unfortunately, sort of very fitting, I don't even have a picture of this wooden shoe because I forgot to take one. But this wooden shoe is a Lost in Collections artifact and has just sort of been floating around and getting moved from place to place. And interestingly enough, although it doesn't have a real accession number or any information about it, someone did write on the bottom of it this, but a previous person at the Smithsonian somehow took this and got the fact that it was from Maine out of it. So just fixing that was one great accomplishment that it's from Nebraska and not Maine. I learned that the life and the research of a curator or intern is never done, but that also leads to a lot of fun that you can do. So 
I got to move outside of my small office at American History, and I got to sort of work with people at the NMAI to arrange loans for an upcoming exhibition, and my supervisor let me choose what they're going to borrow, so that was very exciting. They're thinking about putting stuff about the Louisiana Purchase on an upcoming um, exhibition on immigration, so I worked with the National Archives to figure out, like, what is this... What does this copy of the what's the importance of this copy of the Louisiana Purchase and what's it made out of and can we borrow it? And then I spent a lot of time doing research at the Library of Congress, which is pretty amazing, and they have such a wonderful things. So that all got me out of my office. There's more to conservation and map making that means the eye. This wasn't part of my uh, job really, but I had an opportunity to interview a cons conservator and a map maker for um, we were working on this Red River cart. So here's the, the map maker busy at work. The Red River card is actually the first transportation object accession to the National Museum collection back in the 1880s. And it will be displayed in the upcoming American Enterprise exhibition. So this wasn't my labor, but some interns last summer fabricated all these parts, so I got to like see their work. And then this, just the idea of the th hundreds of hours that have been spent making this, this um, mount for this artifact. And then the last thing I learned is that someone, me this summer, has to do all the research on all those esoteric facts that you never know you needed to know, but you really do. So one of the things, one of the many projects I worked on was um, developing content for some interactive, like touchscreen displays that will go on a new exhibition. So my first week, I had to learn all about different drinks that people were drinking in America. So this is sort of the wireframes from one slide of the um, interactive about cocoa and on a cocoa plantation. But other things that I learned were stuff as interesting as like how much the tea water men were charging for water in New York City, to how much alcohol could George Washington's <coughs> distillery produce, to the fact that Thomas Jefferson's vineyards were never very productive and he never got any wine out of them. But he did have trouble with his bottles of cider that were homemade exploding in the cellar. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot of really interesting facts that have to be done but may never actually see the light of day. And on that note, there I am hard at work in the costume library. <laughs> so any questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Did uh, your experience this summer force you to uh, learn new research skills or expand uh, what you understood to be tradi traditional types of research? I think... Non traditional types of research? I think probably... Although I had to like learn to go places and like get a Library of Congress library card and do those kind of things, it wasn't my supervisor didn't have a lot of time to mentor me in that respect, so I sort of had to just jump in and, and start start running. But I think I did learn a lot about how to process my research because I'm working on I was working on content for one exhibit that won't see the light of day for another two years, so it didn't make any sense or it wasn't important for me to know this stuff and then just sort of leave in two months. So it was really important that I figure out ways of distilling and producing information that could be used in the future. So figuring out how to type up my notes and how to organize my sources and how to leave everything so that my supervisor would be helped by my research and not just know, oh, Becky learned all this stuff, but we still don't know what, what we should talk about in this section. So. Any questions? Why don't we get another round of applause for all the second year students?